I'm Chad Jefferson. I'm Charlotte's. She's my. No, how is that going to work out? <laughs> anyway, we're together. <laughs> We've been married for 16 years now. Got three three children that we love and have a you know. I, I have an interesting perspective on meals because I'm a firefighter. I'm a firefighter for Salt Lake City. And everybody might have a stereotypic, stereotypical idea of what firefighters do. And, and that there is always, you know, when you read about firefighters, we eat a lot and we get interrupted a lot. And that's all true. You know, um, we don't have the best diets, but we do eat a lot because our jobs require a lot of energy. One of the neat things about about this, though, is we we most often come together. So at my work, I go to work for 48 hours at a time. I go to work for two days, and then I come home for four. So it's my second family. And we live in anywhere from stations have anywhere from four to ten ish people in each station, and we tend to eat together as a family. And this is imagine anywhere from 20 to 50 year old men mostly, there's a few women in the department, but that come from completely different parts of the country and different walks of life that want to come together and share something because everyone takes turns cooking mostly, unless you have an extraordinary cook. <laughs> but you, hit, you get to experience everybody else's um, meatloaf or you know the way they like to cook their fish or some people really don't like meat, they just saw pasta and rice. And it's a really good experience. Um, and then obviously everything that you all experience that's normal is, is we, when we're around the table, this is the time for discussion and, and we, everyone settles down, kind of. <laughs> Firefighters, I, I would bet that most everybody's time for dinner is let's relax. You might have a bottle of wine, you might have a, you know, some, some, some sort of food that comforts you and you get to relax and tune out the rest of the world. Well, that's, the one, that's the other thing that's different in, in this family is that you don't, you don't get to turn that off because many of our meals are ruined by alarms. <coughs> so it's not really relaxing time so much. But we definitely share during that time, and I think that's one of the things I love with my family is, is the time that we finally get to calm down and, and talk about the day and learn about the school. And um, one, one last quick thing is uh, I was chuckling with Charlotte when I was sitting next to her when uh, who was somebody was talking about love um, being expressed? Oh, it was Trin. Mm -hmm. Trin's story. Mm -hmm. Because I I cook and do things for love, and that's how I express my love a lot. And I, I it's not enough necessarily for our relationship. Sometimes I have to remember the same thing and you know give a hug and and tell everybody that I love them. But. I, I do the same thing. I love to cook to express my feelings of love for my family. But anyway, that's my story. Anyone else? All right. I'll go. <laughs> My name is Dane Hess, and growing up, my food was also my playground in a lot of ways. I grew up on a dairy farm in rural northern Utah near the Idaho border, and both the cow's food and my food were my playground. I remember playing in the alfalfa fields as a little kid and eating the alfalfa sprouts, <laughs> playing in the cornfield and eating all parts of the corn, <laughs> playing in the wheat field when it was really small, eating the wheat shoots and also as it grew older, you know, rubbing the wheat together in my hands and eating the hard kernels. Uh, spent a lot of time playing in the fields and just experimenting eating different things and I never got poisoned, which is <laughs> lucky. Because we also lived by a river and I'd also explore the river bottoms by my house and just as a curious kid, I would just pop anything in my mouth just to see what it tastes like. But one strong memory I have associated with that playground is every September we would wake up, well every day was early wake up at, at the farm, either to milk cows or school days to wake up and go to school. But we woke up especially early on a, a Saturday in September to do the corn harvest. 
so on the farm we had a large section where we plant just rows and rows of sweet corn and it was a multi-generational multi-family event mm -hmm. so my grandparents were there my grandparents siblings were there probably five or six aunts and uncles and 20 something cousins were there and we got up around 5.30 or 6, went over to the farm and just picked bushels and bushels and bushels of sweet corn. Brought it home and had a whole factory in the kitchen, it seemed like. Well, we had a whole system. So it was me, my grandpa, and my uncles that were outside husking the corn. That was our job. And the cows were in the pasture and we'd throw this, you know, the, the corn husks to them. And the the, my grandma and aunties would take it inside and boil it and then cut the corn off the cob and put it in court um, glad bags to be stored for the winter and all of those 20 cousins, grandparents, great aunts, don't even know how it's related to half of them, but all those people would get corn to store for the winter. And we, we did lottery events every year too, so we, we did a little gambling with our <laughs> with our farming. We we kept track of how many cobs of corn. So it was somebody's job to count every cob of corn. Don't know whose that was. It was never mind. Probably because of my lack of organization skills, but they that was somebody's job and then we had a lottery. You put in a certain amount of money to get a dollar got you a guess in the lottery. So you could put in as much money as you wanted and make as many guesses as you want of the person who got the closest, got all the money. So, yeah, and it seemed to repeat itself. It was corn, we did tomatoes, pears, peaches, potatoes, and my grandma's cellar was ready to survive nuclear <laughs> disaster. <laughs> she had so much food that had all been grown on the farm or in her gigantic garden that we all um, harvested and processed together and it's been neat um, being able to finally that I've now that I've settled down after spending my 20s not living in one place for very long I didn't garden much when I left home at 18 until I settled down now and I've been living with Trin now for a while several years and I've finally gotten able to plant my own garden again which has been really fun and now we've started to do some of those things together as well, like bottling tomatoes and making fresh salsa and sharing produce with our neighbors. And it feels good to be reconnected to my food in that way. It feels like I've come back home. So that's my story. My background is Chinese, and we greet each other with, have you eaten yet? <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell that we come from a culture that food is very, very important. My grandfather used to say, the Chinese will eat anything with four legs except a table. <laughs> and since China was a country that had many famines, we learned how to eat many things that the Americans would go, ew, you eat that? <laughs> but when you're starving, you'll eat anything, including the, the um, bark on the tree, if you can figure out which part of it is a fungus and which part of it is actually edible. Mm -hmm. Food was very important in our family. My grandmother was um, a very good cook, and um, when we were little, she had a little table that was a dining room table that was maybe only that big. And my sisters and I, my sisters over here, yeah. um, would sit around the table and if we weren't eating fast enough, my grandmother would feed us. <laughs> but we loved having my grandmother feed us. So that was always a good excuse to get attention from grandma. <laughs> my father, that was my mother on, my, that was the, my mother's mother. My father owned a restaurant in Washington, D.C., and I remember spending many, many hours playing in the coat room because that was acceptable for us to play in. But I don't remember very much about the kitchen, which I really kind of regret. 
that we never really spent any time there. But I suppose because you're a little kid, you're underfoot, they don't want you in the kitchen. <laughs> my grandmother on my father's side lived in New Jersey, and so in the summers we would go to her house, and she had a takeout uh, business with a huge walk in her kitchen, and people would come and go and buy Chinese food from her. And I remember going in the bins where the, those crunchy noodles are that Chinese food comes with, and I'd go and grab a handful, and finally my mother caught me one too many times. <laughs> and she said, you shouldn't be eating that, that's grandma's broth. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I love what you said about cooking being love. Um, our family gets together a lot. When, now that our children are grown, um, gathering around the table, and eating meals together is our favorite activity. And we go for dim sum a lot, because a lot of us can go at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, we love trying different ethnic foods, because Chinese will eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I can't remember the last time that I said I love you to my mom or that she said I love you to me. And I can't remember the last time that she actually hugged me. But, so how do I know that she loves me? Well, she called this morning and she said, hey, what are you doing? I just made, you know, this rice crepe with shrimp and it's all ready for you. Why don't you come pick it up? I said, mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, great, but I, I'm on my way to take my daughter to a piano um, federation event. <laughs> Can't do it right now. She's like, okay, well, when can you do it today? Uh, it's pretty packed, Mom. She said, okay, well, I'll save it. I'll pack it up in, you know, a, a good box for you. And then I also am <coughs> making soup. I'm making this other soup for you. So tomorrow you just need to come by and eat it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah. So that's um, how I know that she is just full of love for me. But it took me a while to actually recognize that because you know I grew up in the U.S. where I learned that you know you say I love you to mean that you love them, and that was something that was important, and you give hugs and kisses. Um, and so I think that I. Um, I kind of, I kind of actually had to train myself um, to for when she says, "Hey, you know, it's eight o'clock at night, and you're just, you know, you just got home from work, but hey, can you come over to my house right now and pick up the soup?" I have to remember to say, "Oh my God, that's a lot of love," <laughs> and, and feel that. Um, so when I heard that. Um, that the Westview was going to do a whole article on food, I was like, yes, love. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was really excited um, to be able to write a story about a Vietnamese restaurant, a Vietnamese vegan restaurant. And I got to um, work, it, work on it with my mom. She translated it to Vietnamese. And she's not able to be here today, so um, I'm going to read a part of it in Vietnamese. Okay, here we go. Um, tháng 3, 2015, chị Nguyễn Kim Hoa và cậu em Nguyễn Bình đã thực hiện được giấc mơ là mở nhà hàng toàn chai Việt Nam đầu tiên ở Salt Lake City và có thể ở Utah. Chị Kim Hoa nói, tôi ước ao được giới thiệu thức ăn chai đến dân chúng, đặc biệt thức ăn chai Việt Nam. Chị muốn người ta công nhận chữ chai như nhiều người đã biết chữ phở. So, um, all that to say that Nguyễn Kim Hoa and her brother Nguyễn Bình realized their dream and opened um, a Vietnamese vegan restaurant um, first in Salt Lake and maybe Utah. Mm -hmm. 
And um, so Kim Wa says, my dream is um, that people recognize the word yai, which is Vietnamese for vegan, the way that many now recognize the word pho, which is, does anyone know what pho is? Uh -huh. yeah. Delicious noodle soup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, delicious Vietnamese noodle soup. So thank you so much. <laughs>
By creating connections between the school, the community, and the outside partnerships, we will be able to sustain the garden for generations, said the wisest of the, of the mages. The figure considered this. Very well, I will grant you permission to grow a garden. However, this will be your trial run. The figure continued. The community learning center will be built in the same patch of land that you wish to use the garden in three years time. He smiled. If your connections are still intact by the end of those three years, then your garden shall be rebuilt and shall remain there forever. The fellowship went back to their clan and told everyone the good news. Not a moment was wasted in gathering the materials needed to build the garden. By the end of that week, the soil was ready for planting. Soon after, the seeds were sown for the ground. The seeds were sown and the ground beneath it became green and lush. The flowers gave off their lovely fragrance as the bees hummed softly through them. The fruits grew round and bright while the vegetables came in large and robust. All gathered to reap the benefits of the garden. As the people nurtured the plants, so were the relations between others in the community. Though this story of the garden did not exactly happen in this way, I wanted to convey the epic struggle of those involved to make the Community Learning Center or the CLC Gardens a reality. It is from these dedicated people who are students, teachers, administrators, and most importantly, community members, that the garden exists. The reason the garden had been built have been able to flourish is through an intimate triangle of community, schools, and outside partnerships. This is the secret of the CLC Garden's sustainability. The school, in this case Mountain View Elementary, was able to provide the space for the garden to be grown alongside with the students to mentor. The outside partnerships with the University of Utah involves itself with the community. The Benyon Center is involved with the community, community as well, while the Wasatch community uh, gardens helps with the youth education aspect of this. <laughs> Just bringing down the house. <laughs> um, the Glendale community provides added support to their children's education. Um, the CLC garden is one thing that has many benefits and purposes. Not only can it provide food for the community, but it can be used as an edu educational tool as well. Not only can we sustain ourselves by growing our own food, but it is a way to get back in touch with what we eat. We can help our children understand where food comes from, and it allows them to get out of the classroom and make an experience of their own. So what does the CLC Garden hope to obtain? Relationships, community. This is the reason why the garden was made in the first place. It hopes to grow not only food, but connections. Not only nurturing plants, but relations. Thanks. I have a very American upbringing, so not. Um, I guess part of my, my family heritage is Scottish and Swedish, and neither are really known for their food. <laughs> uh, Swedish meatballs, I guess. I had some lingonberries and Swedish pancakes this morning, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think about it. Um, which is, oh, yeah. Where did you find lingonberries? Ikea. Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> like $2.99 for a jar. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was growing up, um, my mom had really severe food allergies, so she couldn't eat anything that was artificial color or an artificial flavor. So think about when you make cookies. Even if you make them from scratch, you might have a bottle of imitation vanilla. They would make her really sick. So I was raised on every meal made from scratch, delicious, and I, I know now how spoiled I was. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a kid, so a special treat would be when we were on vacation and the kids got to eat uh, Cat and Crunch cereal. <laughs> 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 that colors and art, the whole thing is artificial. It's probably made out of styrofoam and sugar. <laughs> it's the favorite thing. I mean, I am so embarrassed now. That's what I look forward to. We're going to. Science National Park, but we get to have Captain Crunch for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> and and I, I grew up, and now I'm in my 30s, and of course it's the opposite. What I crave is what I grew up with, and 
and life gets busy and I eat out and I have frozen meals a lot of the time, but when I really want comfort, I make myself homemade Swedish pancakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's my memory. I'm one of the board members and I shared a food memory um, about my mother. Uh, she does live in a different country so for her food means giving us the nourishment that we need to get through our daily lives and just make sure that we're well fed and a lot of it, a lot of our time spent together when she was living here in Salt Lake City was in the kitchen and she just has amazing food that would always bring our family together. So I was asked to do my story in um, Spanish because that is my first language and just to give a little bit more exposure to the diversity here in the west side. Um, so I'll start my story and I'll, I'll read it in Spanish, just kind of going over a little bit more detail of what I did share already. Mi recuerdo más bonito de comida. La alegría más grande de mi madre es ver su cocina llena de seres queridos y sabiendo que la comida que hace nos da la nutrición y fuerza para hacer todo lo que queremos hacer. Debido que actualmente vivimos en dos países diferentes, le preocupa que no estemos comiendo buena comida. Así que cuando llegamos a casa, a México, siempre nos reciben con abrazos, besos y co comidas caseras. Siempre hay un olor de chiles frescos, tomates, harina, salsas y todo está hecho a la perfección. La cocina de mi madre es su manera de decirnos los mucho que nos ama. So I just kind of, for those of you that speak Spanish, I hope you were able to catch some of that. For those of you that don't, it's just elaborating just on the senses of, the scents, the tastes, and everything that my mom would put together to make sure that we were well fed and always brought together as a family. Thanks for letting me share. Hi everybody, my name is Karen, and I'm deaf, and that's why I'm using an interpreter, but I was born in, with two different cultures in my family. My dad is Indian, from India, and he was born in Fiji, but my mother is full Fijian. And so I um, had both cultures. Um, when I was born, they found I was deaf. It was interesting because I couldn't communicate with my family, and so we communicated definitely through food. Hmm. My grandmothers on both sides showed me um, a lot of things I learned from both of my grandmothers about food. My mother's mother, my maternal grandmother, she, I used to go over there on the weekends and um, during the week I would stay with my father's mother and they lived with us and so I spent a lot of time with them. Um, both of my parents were working and so I stayed with my grandmothers full time. They showed me um, things that I could cook, and they taught me what the traditional things they cook, and um, without any words, you know, we didn't have any spoken communication or sign communication, and so it was pictures. It, they would show me pictures and teach me that way, and they would show me spices and where the spices came from, and lentils. Um, you know, Indian food. Indians love lentils, so. Mm -hmm. um, all of these kinds of food, and then my maternal grandmother on my mom's side, she, um, well, my mom's mom, we call her Boo, B-U, Boo, and so that was our name for, that's what in Fijian, how you say grandmother, and then my dad, on his side, we called her Aji, A-G-I, or A-J-I, sorry, so Boo, she um, lived in the country, and she lived near the ocean. And so we lived on seafood on that side of the family. And then A.G., um, she was a vegetarian. They were all vegetarians. And so it was really different. <laughs> my mom, and when my mom and dad got married, it took a little bit of accommodating, you know, how we would merge the two cultures and families. But 
I look back and my favorite food growing up, and I still cook, is dal, and which is lentils. It's a lentil soup. So it's um, dry peas, and you soak them in water overnight, and then you cut up onions and spices and mix it all together and boil it all, and it becomes dal. So that is definitely my favorite. It always has been. And so um, I always make it, you know, it's something you can, every Monday, that's what I make every Monday, I make mm -hmm. dal, and it's easy, it's fast to cook. So it's, it's something that's super easy, that you just take the dry lentils and they last forever. So you never have to worry about it going bad. You can always have lentils on hand and you've always got something to eat. But I really appreciate both of my cultures um, being involved in my life. So thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hannah John Fisk. Um, we just moved to the west side like four months back. Um, we live near the university. So I moved to Salt Lake City to do my school, my graduate school. And um, it was like, you know, coming from India and it was a, a different country. It was really like, oh, what should I pack and what I should take? And the most, the focus was like, take as much food you want, like, you know, ingredients and things like that, because I did not know if I was going to find an Indian store or ethnic store, uh, because I had heard, like, oh, Salt Lake is really small, and, you know, eight years back it was. Now there is a lot more ethnic stores and things like that. So um, when I came here, um, I think I bought, like, three suitcases, and I most of them was, like, cooking utensils and ingredients <laughs> and I was like, okay, I can eat like for a few days and then I explore. Because I did not know, you know, going uh, going to school, how it's going to be and, uh, but yeah, I managed those few, um, like few weeks and after that I figured out how to go around in the city. Uh, the, the most like, uh, because I come from a region where we eat mostly fish and rice, and here it was like, mm, where do I get fresh fish? <laughs> so for at least like few a months, I didn't didn't like eat that. And then I got to know uh, stores, and I would buy fish. But some of my roommates would make fun of me <laughs> because I would put like uh, we also eat the head, and I would you know make it, and like, what you have a fish head on your bed? And it was so like embarrassing that I stopped cooking like fish and things. And I, I know that a lot of students who come and share apartments, they also go, go through this experience. But somewhere I felt that, oh, I shouldn't give up my own food and, uh, because it connects me to you know, my ancestors, my roots. Um, so then I started like looking for YouTube and seeing more eth like, uh, ethnic food from my region. But I realized that there were like very few YouTubers who did Bengali food. So they started calling my mom, my neighbors, and like take recipes. And uh, so the recipe I put in this news, in the uh, paper is one of my childhood favorite recipes. Usually you get it during wedding, and it's really like, um, very tasty and very flavorful. That's like the first dish they give you in a Bengali wedding. So um, that was my memory. So I thought maybe I'll put it and it's easy to make. Uh, so yeah, that's what is here in this paper. Um, yeah, and um, I like cooking. I always have people over who come uh, announced and announced and there's always food because I, I like to cook, I like to feed everybody, entertain. So it's something very like, um, it, food kind of helps uh, me connect to our friends and family and it's like like how um, oh, what, sorry. Uh, you said that, you know, how it connects and brings the family together. It's same thing with me and my family and that's 
what I put in here. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I did not read word by word. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the opportunity to help write and share. And if you have, if you want to know anything, you can ask me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gwen Christ. I'm the leader of our local chapter of Slow Food, Utah. How many of you have ever heard of Slow Food before? Ah, oh, I'm so <laughs> excited. <laughs> well, for those of you who haven't, there's an article in the Westview that you can read and find out more about it. Um, I like to tell the story of how Slow Food started because I think that's a, a fun um, way to get you familiar with our organization. Um, in 1989, in Italy, on the Spanish Steps in Rome, which is a very historic and culturally important part of Rome in Italy, um, a McDonald's was being built. And there was a group of uh, local citizens who really felt like this was a challenge um, to their way of life and their belief in food and the, and the power that it has to tie communities together. And so on the opening day of that McDonald's, these people gathered together and mm -hmm. offered bowls of pasta to visitors instead to keep them mm -hmm. from going into the McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important because it's really about um, how our communities relate to food, the historic quality of food, how we're brought up with it, and something like a a McDonald's coming in was just a, a real big change um, for that. And so slow food really is about the opposite of fast food, but it's also about preserving what's, what's good and what's clean and what's fair. And that's the mission of slow food, good, clean, and fair food for everyone. So I like to kind of start out with a little story of my own, my, one of my earliest food memories. And this kind of... Um, is a special thing for me because my uh, grandparents are no longer with us. But when I was a little kid, I grew up in Evanston, Wyoming, so just up the up the road. And um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, my grandfather worked for the railroad. And every summer he would take a month off, and he and my grandmother would go to the coast of Washington State and rent a boat and go out fishing for that whole month. And they catch salmon. And sam the salmon runs were really strong and big, and they would catch just tons and tons of it. And they can it in cans at a special factory there and bring it all home. But on the last day before they were to come home, they would always go fishing one last time and catch some salmon and put it on ice in the bottom of their motorhome and drive all the way back to Evanston with that fish on ice. And the night that they got home, we'd have the biggest barbecue. They would bring, all the neighbors brought their grills over to the backyard, and um, we'd light all the fires, and they'd get that fish out of the motorhome on the ice and clean it, and we'd have fresh barbecued salmon. And to this day, salmon is my favorite, favorite food. And I think part of it is not just the wonderful flavor, of course, of that fresh food, but the way that all of our neighbors and all of our cousins and my aunts and uncles and all of us would gather together and have this giant party on my, at my grandmother's house on the corner. And so I think all of us have memories like that of food bringing us together, whether it's special occasions and holidays or whether it's just those everyday moments when we are in the kitchen making a pot of something and a neighbor knocks on the door and pretty soon we have a table full of people sharing that with us. And so I want you guys to think about one of your earliest food memories. Maybe it's from when you were a little kid and something your parents made or a trip that you made somewhere special where you discovered something brand new or um, something like that that will get you thinking about how food ties you into uh, culture and a community and a family in the neighborhood. And then I guess we'll open it up later for people to talk about those experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Thanks. Anyone have any questions for Gwen? Yeah, any, any questions about slow food or salmon? Or <laughs> 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 I can talk about salmon. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so I'll be around the whole time, so just holler at me if you need me, and we'll come back up and talk about that in a little while. Um, love this book. Beautiful book. Um, I love it because it's stories about people. It's, you know, it's, it's, if, have you guys seen this? So it starts with a person, and it tells their story, and then they share a recipe, and then they um, they share the cooking of it, and they teach how to cook it. And so I don't think I can pick one because they're all so beautiful. But one thing that I really loved is that when I was flipping through there. I saw so many people that I love and that I know, not personally, but I know their faces and they're from their community. And they're so diverse. I mean, there's like 15 countries represented in this book. And that is so wonderful to me. That's, that's my community, that's my Glendale, where I grew up and my children are growing up. And my parents and my grandparents grew up in this really diverse place where everybody comes together and makes this beautiful thing where we have black beans that smell like Indian food <laughs> and you know that are all mixed together and it's so beautiful so I recommend this book I love it um, it's a good Christmas gift right <laughs> 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 <laughs>